Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the Sentencing Project and the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls for a webinar examining female incarceration. My name is Morgan McLeod and I am the Communications Manager at the Sentencing Project. Today you will hear from the Sentencing Project Senior Research Analyst, Nazgul Ganoush, who will present the latest numbers on female and girls incarceration. She will then facilitate a discussion with leading advocates in this area, Andrea James, Executive Director of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, Don Harrington, Executive Director of Free Hearts in Nashville, Tennessee, and Jessica Nolan, Executive Director of the Young Women's Freedom Center in San Francisco, California. There will be a Q&A after the presentation. You can submit your questions anytime during the presentation or during the Q&A using the panel on your webinar screen. If you look on the toolbar on the right, there's a section for you to type in your questions. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted online afterwards. So to begin, I will hand things off to the Sentencing Project Senior Research Analyst, Nazgul Gannoush. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining. I'm gonna go over some of the main points from the brief that we recently produced on incarceration of women and girls, and then I'll turn it over to the other panelists to really fill in uh, with their knowledge and expertise on these issues. So there are currently 1.2 million women under the supervision of the criminal justice system. One million are on probation or parole, and another 200,000 are in local jails and state and federal prisons. And that's what you can see in the chart here, shown in this slide. So the growth of women's incarceration has been uh, seven, over 700% 700 since 1980, between 1980 and 2016. That's a rate of growth that's twice as high as that of men. So although women make up a much smaller share of the prison population than men, about 7% of the prison population are women, the rate of growth of women's incarceration has far outstripped that of men. And this growth is a result of more expansive law enforcement efforts, stiffer drug uh, sentencing laws, and post-conviction barriers that uniquely affect women. So these policies are largely driven by local and state policies. And as a result, um, these outcomes are live, driven by local and state policies. And so as a result, we see a lot of variation in imprisonment rates across states. So at the national level, 64 out of every 100,000 women are imprisoned. And that was the figure from 2016. But some states in the South particularly have a much higher rate of female imprisonment, including Oklahoma and Kentucky, whose level of female imprisonment is over twice the national average. In some states, particularly those in the Northeast and the New England area, the rate of imp imprisonment for women is much lower. Um, and so those states include Maryland, uh, sorry, Massachusetts and Rhode, Rhode Island, which are uh, have the lowest levels of female incarceration in the country. There are some things that are really distinct about women's incarceration, and one of them is the fact that women are overwhelmingly imprisoned for nonviolent crimes. So more than half of women, 52% in, in prisons, um, state and federal, were imprisoned for a nonviolent crime, for a property or a drug offense. Um, that's different than for men, because for men, more than half were imprisoned for a violent offense, typically assault or robbery. Something else that's distinct about women is that most incarcerated women have young children. So over 60% of women in state prisons had a child, have children under the age of 18. So I wanna to talk to you a bit about the racial and ethnic composition of incarcerated women. Um, what you can see here is uh, both the trends in recent years and levels of imprisonment for African-Americans, Hispanics and whites and how where we are in recent years. So currently African-American women are imprisoned at twice the rate of white women and Latina women are imprisoned at 1.4 times the rate of white women. And this disparity represents 
some amount of progress from years past. So between 2000 and 2016, the rate of imprisonment uh, for African American women has declined by 53%. So while there's still a lot more work that needs to be done in order to achieve e equality in these figures, uh, we've come a long way. But on the other hand, there's also been um, some steps backwards for white women and Latina women. So the rate of in in female imp imprisonment for white women has risen by 44% over this period, and for Latina women, it's increased by 12%. Then let me tell you a little bit about incarcerated girls. So the number of girls and boys in residential place placement has declined by half since 2011. In 2001, 15,000 girls were confined in residential placement. By 2015, this figure had been cut in half. Girls comprise 15% of incarcerated youth, but they make up a much higher proportion of those incarcerated for the lowest level offenses. So 38% of youth incarcerated for status offenses are, are girls, and more than half of youth incarcerated for running away are girls. Um, as we saw with women, the racial disparities for incarcerated girls is even worse. So girls of color uh, are much more likely to be incarcerated than white girls. So in particular, Native, Native girls, American Indian girls, are in, incarcerated at four times the rate of white girls. For Af African American girls, it's three and a half times the rate of white girls. And for Latina girls, they're 38% more likely to be incarcerated than white girls. Um, so I'll stop with that overview. And I'd love to turn it over now to our other panelists to share with you the work that they've been doing that to address the problems that are reflected in these statistics. And so Let's start with Andrea and then turn it over to Don and Jessica. And I'd love to hear from you all about the work that you've been doing and your personal experiences with the issues reflected in these statistics. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sentencing Project and NASGOL and everybody else in, uh, for inviting uh, the National Council on to this uh, great webinar and all of the fantastic information that you continue to provide to help us, that helps us to do our work. Uh, and of course, at the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, our name speaks for itself. That's who we are. We are currently incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women and girls. And we started our work while incarcerated, actually, uh, back in 2010, beginning as incarcerated women in the federal system, organizing ourselves because we heard an uptick in conversation around uh, um, mass incarceration and the, and, and the need to address this and to, to shine a light on it and to work on ways to reduce our incarceration population. And we were women sitting in a federal prison in Danbury, Connecticut and said, we don't hear anything about the issues involving women, the very gender specific issues of women and girls. And um, the majority of us uh, were mothers at the time, and uh, we didn't hear anything about the effects of incarceration of women on our children and the disruption that incarceration was causing to our children, our families, and our community. So we started to organize ourselves, and that organizing led to what is now um, some years later, finally establishing the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. And we do our work from the space of prison abolition, first and foremost. So as women that know what it's like to be in prisons, and, and also our work has extended beyond just the federal system and women who are incarcerated in the federal system. It includes all of our sisters and fam uh, uh, who are formerly incarcerated and uh, currently incarcerated in federal, state, and county, um, and also inclusive of uh, our folks that uh, have not been in prison but have uh, been convicted and prosecuted and gone through that. And, and a number of our members are uh, women and girls and fam who um, uh, have had the experience of a loved one and supporting a loved one. And so we do our work with a number of phenomenal local organizations that do and national organizations that do incredible work. You're going to hear from some of them after I finish. Um, but uh, we do our work to end incarceration of women and girls. 
And we do it through a participatory process, which means that we don't do anything, not one thing, without first reaching inside to the women, uh, girls, and fam who are on the prison bunk and asking them what direction we need to take. How are we doing? And what are the thoughts and ideas? And then we bring those thoughts and ideas from uh, those folks inside, outside to our formerly incarcerated uh, members. And uh, we begin every single process on, on um, doing that. And so we develop public awareness and social media campaigns to give vi visibility to incarceration of women and girls. We advance public policy around those issues. And really it's from this, this, this space that we, we don't hear our perspective uh, uh, a lot because it's very different for women who know what it's like to be on that prison bunk to talk about these issues. And I think that our voices and our ideas and our projects are incredibly important and that we need to be considered part of the expert field as well. Uh, because uh, when uh, the sentencing project provides this incredibly important information to us and, uh, and, and other organizations, uh, it's those of us who can really uh, bring what we call the people to the policy and help uh, the policymakers and the general public understand how we can make, create meaningful change based on our real uh, life and lived experiences. Great, thank you so much. Don, would you like to talk a little bit about the work that you've been doing next? We can't hear you yet, Don. Don, is your mic on? Let me see. Morgan's going to come over and let me let me know if I can help. Top. I need to click it. No. no. Hi, Don. Will you click the red mic button on the webinar panel? We can't hear you yet. Okay. <laughs> oh, perfect. Right. So, yes, my name is Don Harrington, and I am the executive director of Free Hearts and a systems manager of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. And uh, Free Hearts is an organization that's based in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, we're led by formerly incarcerated women, and uh, we provide support, education, and advocacy for families impacted by incarceration with the ultimate goals of reuniting families and keeping families together. Um, we are one of the many organizational affiliates of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls that is led by formerly and currently incarcerated women. And so what we do in Nashville, we, um, we do the direct service work where we go into the jails, we go into the prison, uh, we go into juvenile, and then we also go into um, five schools for children whose parents are incarcerated. And we do classes and support groups. Um, and also look for ways to advocate um, for, for them individually and also for their families. And um, on the advocacy side, we do participatory defense, um, which I will probably speak a little more about later, um, and also storytelling for public policy, where we look to advance policy that impacts ourselves and our families and our community. Um, so actually through that we we were one of the um, members of the primary caretaker coalition that um, introduced legislation in our state that was based on a, a national council model uh, to get community-based alternatives for primary caregivers of dependent children, uh, primary caretakers of dependent children under the age of 18. So um, yes, our, our work is is to divert as many women and girls um, out of custody and also to keep as many families together as we can and hopefully to keep all of our families together. 
Thank you so much for that introduction to your work. Jessica, would you like to tell us a little bit about the work that you've been doing? Sure, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, first, thanks so much for being on the call. Really excited to be here today. Um, uh, my name is Jessica, I'm with the Young Women's Freedom Center. And um, we are also a member of the National Council. So glad to be with everybody here. We've been, uh, we're based in San Francisco. We're a statewide organization. And we work to invest in the leadership and power of young women who have been incarcerated, grown up on the streets, um, young moms, girls that have been in foster care, um, to transform not, our, not only our own lives, but to lead transformation of the systems that criminalize and incarcerate us. Um, so just a little context of our work, we're, we're 25 years old. Um, we are an organization that's led for and by the, the young folks that we serve. 95% um, of our staff are formerly incarcerated, 75% have been in the child welfare system. And over the past 25 years, we've worked with 38,000 um, young women who have been in the justice system to really find their voice, build personal power, build collective power, because we really believe that in order for us to radically transform um, the, the state of our country, we have to have um, radical vision. And that comes from formerly incarcerated system involved, um, young folks who have really felt the most corrosive impacts of injustice. Um, so, our, so what do we do? Our work is centered on, on three things. So one is we meet young women where they're at. So we work in detention centers, we're on the streets, we're in uh, the neighborhoods, and we work with young women over time, again, to find their voice, build their power, um, and to really uh, build a collective power with women to really uh, come up with a new a, a new future. And so that looks like we do research. Um, we conduct our own research really to, um, as, a, as something for the field to really uh, be able to support the work that all of us are doing. Um, the current project we're working on is really looking at in California, how multiple systems work together to criminalize poor young women of color. So we're looking at the intersections of child welfare, foster care, juvenile justice, criminal justice, the educational system, um, poverty, uh, including uh, public benefits and welfare. Uh, and we're also looking at, um, at housing. And um, we also do uh, statewide organizing. We have a, a coalition that's statewide, the Young Women's Freedom Coalition. It has over 200 members, members of formerly incarcerated um, women and girls from, from throughout the state. And we have a, a bill of rights that we collectively built about a year and a half ago at a at a convening. And our work right now, oh, here's the bill of rights. Um, and this is not something we're passing as legislation, but this is the collective vision of formerly incarcerated um, and system involved women and girls in California of, of what do we deserve, what are our rights. And over the next year, we're supporting local campaigns throughout the state of system involved formerly incarcerated women and girls working on local change and then we're convening next march where we're looking at how do we really create policies from beginning to end including implementation and oversight that are really led for us by us um, so that's the work that we do and um yeah i guess the only other thing i'd like to say is that we really know we, we've done some longitudinal data study on our impact over the 25 past 25 years and we know that while we're uh, really working to tear down the the systems of incarceration in this country that we need to to really be thoughtful about how all these systems are really criminalizing um, our folks and um, you know to when we look at who we've worked with the 38,000 women a hundred percent have grown up in poverty and 100% have been directly impacted by physical or sexual violence. And so we, we think that it's really important that we talk about this work um, broadly and at the intersections of, of racism and patriarchy and, and, um, and criminalization. So yeah, I'm really glad to be here and, and work with all of you as well. 
Thank you all so much for that. Um, so I have just a couple questions that I want to ask you before I turn it over to the questions from the audience. So I would love to hear a little bit more about the participatory process that you mentioned, Andrea, and um, how that's changed the nature of your work, but also, Don, that you mentioned the participatory defense process. Um, if you could tell us in a little bit more detail how you know how you've seen having the involvement of system impacted folks in, in the process of reform has, has shaped it for the better. Um, we'd love to hear a little bit more detail about that. Sure, and I just wanna start by really lifting up everything that we've just heard from Don Harrington at Free Hut and Jessica Nolan at the Young Women's Freedom Center because really why the National Council exists is to do just that, is to, is to, is to find out what these incredible local, state-based, city-based, uh, county-based uh, organizations and, and individuals who are formerly incarcerated women and, 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 and directly affected women and girls are doing because they are really doing incredible work as you've just heard and sharing that, making sure that we're connecting the dots with women who are in Maine, with women who are in uh, Arkansas, with women who are in the Bronx, to women who are in San Francisco and women who are in Tacoma, Washington and all of these other places to share information, to share their ideas, to share their projects and to join our voices collectively for the meaningful change that you heard both Don and Jessica refer to. It's really the, the hyper local work that's happening in communities around this country by directly affected women and girls that are going to create and move us in the direction of meaningful change. And so that's why we exist at the National Council to lift that, those voices and those ideas and those projects up. So I wanna just thank again, Jessica and Don because they're just both very brilliant and passionate and committed to this work. So um, in terms of, and that's what it's all about. It's about a participatory process. So we don't, um, do things from a top-down space. We do things really from a community-led space. And how do we create those changes by sharing those local projects and ideas across the country, connecting all of us together and using our voices as one uh, in a participatory process, meaning that it's community-led. Those women and girls from our communities who are directly affected, who know the changes that need to be made. Because otherwise, when we're not doing that from a, from a place of a participatory process where everybody involved and, and, and directly affected is engaged in, in, in addressing these issues, we're just in this silo and we're only looking at things from the place of just criminal legal reform or just housing or just food or just... Uh, uh, economic development. And we need to be looking at these issues collectively. We need to be saying, how do all of these uh, complexities in the lives of the women who we uh, are, are all working with and who we all are, how are the, the complexities of our lives intersecting, the issues intersecting with each other, and how are we uh, using our experiences to really push for meaningful changes. And that that opens us up to a much broader field than just criminal legal reform, because that's not what's going to create the changes that we need directly from our communities to really uh, transform uh, uh, and turn around the disruption that's been caused by the reliance upon prisons and fees and fines and mass incarceration and all of the the things that are, uh, need to change. Thank you. Don, did you want to say a bit more about the participatory defense work that you were doing? Or is it, did you want to add more to that? Yes. Yes, so uh, the participants model that uh, started in San Jose, California uh, with debug. And um, actually, the National Council also has several participatory defense hubs, and we are the Nashville hub for participatory defense. And what it is is a, a community organizing model where we're organizing people that are facing charges currently or at any stage of the judicial process because we have a lot of uh, uh, women also that are like post conviction or um, that are that are incarcerated and have been there for quite some time but are are working to come home. 
and uh, we have a weekly meeting and where we where we go over uh, update and, and a to do list for uh, trying to impact the outcome of that cases for the better. But another great thing about this is that through you know, working on the cases and working to bring our family members home and our community members home, um, we also see opportunities to make more meaningful change and, and through the patterns that arise. Like we've read it to a few cases where uh, women were criminalized for the actions of their abusers. And so we realize that that's an issue in our state and are working to you know make a more meaningful uh, policy changes around that and also uh, using our affiliation with the national council to um, get legislation that is being worked on in other states specifically um, new york has a dv uh, criminalization bill that we're looking to introduce here uh, just because we see it's an issue here through our participatory defense work. Uh, we've also been seeing a lot of like women that just for example bring their child to a, to a hospital to get help to get services because they fail or because the water burned them and then they are turned around and criminalized for um, those actions and so we see that as an issue and we also see a lot of our girls that um, are pulled out of school with several officers with like riot gear with no you know uh attorney or no parent present and they're making statements that really could impact them for years to come and so um through our participatory defense work we really look for opportunities to uh make more meaningful change and to just see like what are the patterns um that we are seeing here on the ground where women and girls are being criminalized and how can we work to impact the, the actual system as opposed to just working on the individual cases alone? Great, thank you so much for that. Um, so another question I have is, Andrea, in the past I've heard you talk about transformative justice, as, uh, and so I'm wondering if you could talk a bit more about that and how it shapes the work that you're doing. Sure, so we really have looked at this from this really big bird's eye view of like, what do we need to do to not just address things as Don said on case by case uh, basis or looking at individual women, which we always do and working with individual women, but really how do we shift the system? And to do that, uh, it involves finding ways uh, to pull back from the current system and really engage communities in taking back their power. Engage communities in being a part of the process of making decisions about what does justice look like for us? What do we want our communities to look like? Well, how do we envision them looking like? And often it means finding ways of, of, of resolving disputes of uh, resolving differences or resolving harm that's been caused that does not involve the current traditional system actors, such as law enforcement, for instance, and that would uh, uh, ultimately lead to an arrest or many arrests based on an incident that just needed some community engagement and some community involvement. And so we really are in the research phase of this. We've been learning a lot from many groups like the Black Mama Bailout and from Law for Black Lives and these other groups that are teaching us and survived and punished, Marian Kaba, these, these just incredibly brilliant women who are talking about these alternatives these different ways, I would rather call it, of creating a system that is led by the people in our communities. And transformative justice is one of those systems that really provides an opportunity for us in our communities to say, well, we're gonna rely upon our pods instead. So when law enforcement shows up, the community is saying, listen, we know this person and this person has their set of people that can help them through whatever this difficult situation is. Why don't the law enforcement take a step back and allow the community members to take a step in? Because by tomorrow morning, this is gonna be a very different situation that if it's dealt with through the traditional uh, 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 
streams of, of, of law enforcement and the courts and charging somebody and then and, and all that leads to that, we're going to have a very different outcome than communities really beginning to build using starting with the bail funds, going from the bail funds into participatory defense, what we just heard Don speaking about, going from participatory defense to the use of transformative justice and looking at all of these things and pulling them together into a design a community justice design that we can share with our local organizations around the country to really begin to bring the community back into what we've been isolated from because of the current structure, criminal legal structure, bring the community and the voices and the people back in and really begin to transform our communities. Thank you so much. Um, so I would love to hear from you all to your reflections on what has helped us make the progress that we've made so far, both in reducing the number of girls that are in the criminal justice system. Um, so Jessica, I'd love to hear from you on that. And also what's helped to reduce, especially the level of African-American women's incarceration. And on the flip side, what's going on you, and you know, what is it that's driving the increased rate of incarceration for white women? So I would love to hear sort of from your perspective of like nuts and bolts, particular policies that's helped to bring about the progress and the, what's the work that's left to be done. Sure. Um, so I just want to say, you know, in California, the, the detention rates of, of youth in juvenile halls is, is going down in, in multiple counties. I will want to say part of the the reason that we started this research project is, you know, we we have not seen structurally stuff get better for the young women that are being incarcerated, right? There's still no housing, they're still in poverty, they're, you know, um, still having to do survival sex work. So there's all of these things, and yet not as many are are being locked up in juvenile hall, um, and and we have juvenile probation departments around the state really excited about how, how much they've they've done. So so I, I do want to say that we have not seen stuff get better for girls, right? Um, we also have seen increase in uh, what we call TAY, transitional age youth in the county jails locally, right? So um, so that's one thing I just wanted to, to put out there uh, initially. Um, and then I, I do also want to say, at least in California, we have a, a lot of work to do. Um, and San Francisco is, is a perfect example of the, you know, explicit and implicit uh, racism that's happening for particularly black girls. In San Francisco, the African-American population is a little bit under 6%. In 2016, 58% of girls in San Francisco's juvenile hall were black. And they're from three neighborhoods. Um, so I think that, um, you know, the at every step of the system from policing of communities to court to, you know, everything that there is explicit and implicit bias that we see playing out um, as, a, as a local organization, our, our strategy is really to be there as much as we can every single step of the way, um, because we know that, that this is what's happening. Um, and I, I think, you know, a, another thing that, that we just uh, see a lot with, with girls is, um, you know, what, what they're being arrested for, especially places like uh, Santa Clara and San Francisco, where we see the divide of, of an equity even greater than, at a greater than it's ever been, is that, you know, the assault and robbery charges is, is what's um, getting these young folks locked up. And when you really read into the cases that they're, um, you know, their phone snatches that turned to felonies. There, we had a young woman who stole laundry soap and threw it at the security guard when she was running out. That turned into a felony and assault. And and so they're they're really overcharging. And it, it's again because folks don't have access, opportunities, and support. Um, so so I did want to say that as um, as something. Um, and as we're really digging into our research um, and really. We, we definitely see a huge correlation between homelessness um, and incarceration, as well as um, the role that the child welfare plays, the child welfare system plays into incarceration. This is something we're also seeing in New York with young folks that we're working with, who the um, they're often in foster care placements or receiving homes, and they end up in the juvenile justice system because they're 
they're being criminalized for just normal um, youth behavior. Thank you so much. Andrea and Don, would you like to tell us a bit about what you've seen as helping to reduce the, the numbers of African American women going into the system in particular and, and what you're seeing in terms of the need of, to address the rising rates of incarceration for white women? Well, um, first of all, I think that there has been um, some years of focus on uh, communities of color coming together to have these conversations and and do work on reducing incarceration and reducing our numbers. But Jessica uh, raises a, a, a huge point uh, that I don't just want to go over. I want to really emphasize that um, the lack of access to opportunity and 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 also the deeply embedded racism that causes systems to treat black and brown girls and 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 women in the way that they have um and continue to do is uh, is 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 still most of the problem and but there have been uh efforts uh over some years now to reduce incarceration population now i can speak for women and i know that the fact that incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women uh and girls and and fam starting to work together. Oh, Andrea, if you could just pause for a second. Could you just pause for a second and just go back about a minute because you started to break up. Let's just do a, a test with you. Can you hear me right now? Yep, you're you're fuzzy. You're fuzzy, but I can hear you. Can you hear me okay? Oh, you're going out, Nazgul. Can anybody hear me? I can hear you. I think it's Nazgul. I think it's on sent. I think it's on your end, Nazgul. Good. I'm glad you can hear me, Jess. You good? Sorry. We put something in the chat. I can't hear you at all. Just keep talking. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Do you want me, I'm going to nod your head if you'd like me to keep talking. Jess and I can hear you, but Don, can you hear us also? Yes, I can hear. Uh, I can hear you, Andrea, and I can see you, but I think it's the sentence part. Okay. Sorry, sentencing. We can all hear each other. Nope. Do you? I can. I. I feel bad because I can't go on. Okay. Well, hello. Hi. We chat the questions. Yeah, yeah, we can chat. I just want to just make the point about okay, the I'll reduction right and, try to fix this. and increase. I think the attendees could hear you. Okay. So I'm I'm going to finish my point so that I'm not the one holding things up. I don't know, Nazgul. We can't hear you at all. We can see you talking. Yes, we're bored. Andrew, uh, you, I did the question. No, I didn't hear the so question. You talked about the racism in the system that people yeah. of color, especially going through. And so, what what about after that? What? Well, let me just make this point, okay? Uh, there okay, is the reception is still not good. Are the okay? We're just going to pause for a minute, try to fix it.
Oh, okay. That was clear. We're good. We're good. Andrea, are you there? Okay, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, please. Yeah, okay, I can great. hear you. Please continue. I, I want to just make a point. I mean, we we are, and the, and, the, and the Sentencing Project does give us the numbers, but I want to just make a point of, of, of saying this, that although the uh, incarceration levels for uh, African-American women have de been on the decline and in incarceration levels for white women have been on, have increased, uh, black women are still incarcerated at double the rate, okay? So we can't lose sight of that. And it would take years you know, for that to become, you know, parity, which we're not interested in having. We want to end incarceration of all women and girls. And mm -hmm. so, but the 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 effect that 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 incarceration has had, and and how it's targeted directly black women uh, since our history here in this country, and the disruption that it has caused in our communities and in our families and in our children is something that even with this lowering of incarceration rates of black women, we still are, our communities and our families and ourselves are still struggling and suffering from the, 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 the results of that. Um, and clearly with our black girls, there is still, a, 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 and, and Latina girls, there is such a, a targeting and disproportionate criminalization of them as we see in our schools, as we heard Jessica uh, raise those issues. So I just wanna make sure that everybody's clear about that. We're not over the, the extent of the harm that's been caused to black and brown communities and black women in particular, who've just for, for ever in this country have been targeted and overcriminalized. Um, and so what we do see though, and what we believe is one of the contributing uh, uh, reasons for uh, this decrease is that we're organizing ourselves. And when you give women, women have always been resilient and, and brilliant. And, and we always sometimes paint ourselves as, as victims. Women are survivors. And women are courageous, and women are brilliant, and 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 manage to figure things out. And we have done that on behalf of ourselves, on our families, on our children, our communities. And so, over the past few years, there has been a real increase and in raising of our voices, and and making the rest of the world pay attention to us, and making uh, ourselves visible. And I think that because this has disproportionately affected women of color, women of color has have galvanized themselves more over the past couple of years with this uprising and this uplifting of voices of directly affected women and girls. That has been a lot of the reason why we are realizing and, and catching on and doing the ideas and the brilliant work of women in other parts of the country to transform our lives and our children and our community. Not to say also that yes, so there has been an increase in uh, poverty of white women. There's been, uh, you know, the, the 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 base of white women that were left, as so many black women have been left over the years, with little access to housing, uh, jobs, uh, dignified, sustainable uh, employment, um, and economic democracy. All of those things add to that. Uh, uh, an increase in in um, uh, addiction, the illness of addiction um, in in communities, and not to say you know black uh, women and girls and black people in general in this country have never ever and will never be because of our numbers the the majority of people who use and sell drugs in this country. But our communities have been the communities that have been targeted. Um, now uh, with an increase in 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 uh, the illness of addiction from what we're seeing and what we're learning from our membership. That is affecting white communities and 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 cash poor white women more um, than it ever has been, and that's the slippery slope. That's this is what happens when we continue to not address the issues, the structural barriers that we heard Jessica refer to that affect the lives of cash poor people and people who are living in communities that have been ignored, that that are resource deprived. This is what happens. And eventually that slippery slope will lead to uh, affecting the lives of other people. Thank you so much. So I want to make sure that we have enough room, enough time for questions from the audience. So um, Morgan, would you like to, do you have questions you'd like to pose to the panelists?
Yes. Um, so we've got a lot of questions that have started to come in. And thank you, Nazgul and Jessica and Dawn and Andrea for that uh, discussion. Um, and just wanted to remind everyone that you can submit questions in the questions panel on the right on your GoToWebinar page. Um, but a couple questions that have already come in that I can just ask for everyone. And everyone can feel free to share your screens, all the panelists, if you'd like to. Um, the first question is, uh, is the high proportion of men in the criminal justice system distracting from advocacy reform efforts for women? And in the effort to eliminate mass incarceration, how do you suggest bridging the gap to make sure specific populations like women, children, or the LGBTQ communities aren't ignored and everyone benefits from criminal justice reforms? You can take it, Jessica. <laughs> I was just going to say, working at a, a women and girls organization for, uh, I've been involved with 20 years, but uh, I think that it's reflective of our society in general, right? Women and um, girls issues are often pushed to the side. I think that, um, you know, and, and the same thing happens with uh, in criminal justice space. Um, but what I do think is, is so important is that um, organizations like the National Council, like, um, Free Hearts, like the Young Women's Freedom Center, is uh, that we are women, cis and trans women, gender nonconforming folks who are organizing and leading, and um, I think that's where that where the change is is going to come from. But I I also think that we lead differently, right? I'm every time generally I talk about the Young Women's Freedom Center and the work we do, it, it you know it's um, someone stands up and and um, uh, says, you know, what what about the men's? What about the men's works, right? And I think that, um, you know, women, we are, we are caregivers. We always say that, like, the, the, young, the young women that come from the Young Women's Freedom Center are leading uh, freedom and liberation for everyone because we move in circle, you know, like, our, and our, our freedom and liberation is tied to, to everyone else's. So I think that it's also re, reframing, right? I think that, uh, the story of incarceration and criminalization of poor young women of color um, hasn't been told or looked at. And, and so I think that's part of the research that we're doing as well too, right? Because it's not that, like we have to look at, as we were working to tear down uh, the, the criminal justice system and mass incarceration, we have to look at how women and girls have been systematically criminalized because what we don't wanna do is create uh, and, and we work really hard on this. We don't want to defund, uh, you know, mass incarceration, and then it's it's all all the funding is going to social services and foster care because what we know is that system hurts just as much too. It's not freedom when I have a young woman come to me who's not in jail anymore, but her three kids were taken away on Thursday. Right? It, that's not winning. That's that's doing just as much harm. To the next generation so i think that we just have to think about these issues as more than just it's more than just women's issues but we need a uh, women to lead does anyone and, else you know we're 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 you know the mothers sisters aunts wives uh grandmothers of 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 communities and uh, uh that just doesn't include uh, women and girls, it includes uh, gender nonconforming, it includes fam, it includes everybody. And uh, I'm a mother of a boy. I'm also a woman who is married to a man um, and, and come from a community where all of the work that we do, all of the work that we do is about transforming our community. The fact that we are unapologetic about uh, how we define the work that we do and center it in women and girls um is something again that we don't apologize for um and what we found that when prior to uh us really raising our voices we had those pioneers like susan burton who was talking about women and girls and the need to end incarceration of women and girls and why that was so important uh but uh outside of of, of that we just there there was not and of course, the work of Young Women's Freedom Center in that local uh, 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 part of uh, the, the country in California and Coalition for California Coalition for Women Prisoners. I mean, we can go on and on, but it's important that we can do this work 
and be able to say, we do this work from a space of women and girls and, and not have to apologize for that or not have to make excuses for that uh, because that's important too. That work is important too. And it contributes though, because of the participatory process and because of the transformative work that we're doing in our communities, it contributes to really creating the meaningful change across the board. Great, thank you. Um, another question is, how do you see drug courts working for or against the women's decarceration efforts to anyone? Uh, I, somebody else, uh, well, yeah, so, go ahead. I, I think, I'm gonna, I, I wanna take myself out of this because I'm not the best person to respond to this. Um, we believe in community justice and it doesn't start with creating more opportunities for courts to do the work that we believe that should be done from within our communities and in a community-led process. And to follow up uh, on that, someone also specifically asked you, Andrea, uh, why does Andrea believe that letting communities step in uh, instead of law enforcement will produce better outcomes, if you'd like to wrap all that up again? Well, I, I I think a lot of it uh, speaks for itself. Look at all of the tension that is happening right now across the country, the miscommunication and the lack of understanding about our communities and our people, the lack of, of, of respect for us as human beings, particularly in communities of color. We have to do a lot of work with law enforcement um, to really shift the culture of law enforcement in this country right now. And when we a lot of the, the issues that law enforcement responds to that leads to these not great outcomes uh, are, are things that need to uh, be worked on amongst ourselves within our communities. We have a lot of better ideas than just leading to law enforcement. Law enforcement is the gateway to the court system. Law enforcement is the gateway to incarceration. So as long as we're just relying on law enforcement as that, as that front line, to resolving problems that mostly are related to uh, our lives within our communities, um, then we're, we're not gonna have the better outcomes that we need. And so um, um, I, I, I believe that law enforcement is not the answer. Law enforcement should be an absolute last resort um, um, and that there are so many others. And that's what transformative justice is all about. That's what participatory defense is all about. That's what the community led participatory processes that are happening in our communities across the country is all about. That's what the Young Women's Freedom Center and Free Hots is all about. Bringing our young women and our women and our fam and our gender nonconforming folks together uh, uh, to talk about what are better ways of helping each other to deal with the complexities and, and, and that arise in our lives. Law enforcement is not the best answer for that. Anyone else? I'll just say a quick word about drug courts overall. The research that I've seen on drug courts has suggested that they can be they have the potential to help divert people away from prison. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes what can happen as well is that people who wouldn't have been prison bound end up going uh, through drug courts. And then when they um, struggle with their substance use disorder and relapse, then they end up getting caught in the net and getting incarcerated as a result of that. So ideally, we would design drug courts so that they're getting people into their system that are uh, would have been would have gone to prison otherwise rather than bringing more people into the criminal justice system and for, especially for people whose only offense is using or potentially selling drugs in order to sell in, in order to sustain their um, substance use disorder what we need to make sure is that they have access to effective drug treatment in their communities so that means um, expand the Affordable Care Act and the Medicaid expansion and uh, that's an important critical tool to be able to get people access to um, substance use treatment and mental health treatment. And, and the important work that Cassandra Frederick is trying to teach us all about in terms of safe injection sites. I mean, that's community-led change, right? How do we begin to provide the resources that people really need so that they can transition into uh, better health uh, outcomes for themselves? And I think um, just to build off what Andrea said, like. We see it with girls court as well and, and drug court, but these specialized courts that may have good intention, the key problem, again, is they're not developed 
by the community and or run by the community. So we see tons of young folks that we work with who are sent to drug court for weed, for smoking pot, right? And who end up getting really long sentences. It's same, and, and similarly with the girls court, right? It's like this obsession with 30 people coming together to define how do we, you know, help this girl but she's not at the center of what she needs in her own life. And so, so the restrictions become so much. She gets locked up for not going to meet a therapist who she didn't identify with. So I think that like we have to look at how these specialized courts actually are harming, specifically I'm talking about youth, more than helping them. Um, the next question is talks about what's being done to allow mothers to remain connected with their children while they're in jail or in prison? Um, and if you, this person had a question of if you feel like there are any negative impacts on the child when that happens. Uh, well, one thing that we're doing here is uh, we, we have a program called Mother's Day Out uh, where we're bringing mothers out of the facility into the community once a week in their regular clothes the officers come in their regular clothes they don't shackle them to come there they just sit in the seat and they come in regular vehicles and uh they bring we bring their children into the community as well and the officers they stay out of the room and and they just let us have the space um where the mothers can um visit with their kids in a in an environment that is um not like a prison environment but um, and we, we love that program. Uh, the better the better situation would be to just let them go home because they're obviously safe enough, uh, there isn't a public safety risk for them to be around children or for them to not be in the facility. So I will just say that. Um, also know about, which we visited one uh, last year, the babies in the, in cars, the babies behind bars type of programs and not really a huge fan of that because again um what child do, prison is not a place for a child to to grow up and so um yes and, and obviously if they if they're not a public safety risk to where they can be around these children then they should be able to just let them go home and so um that's that's why we know that we can end the incarceration of women and girls because uh, they're not posing a public safety risk. And so, yeah, these efforts to bring families together um, are important because if families should be together, but we would rather for families to be together in the community. And and that's that's really an important point because that's the the we love the Tennessee uh, Nashville and the Free Hots program that brings the mothers out into the community we're not in favor of bringing our children and our babies. And what we get all the time is uh, uh, people who design these programs to bring children more into the prison environment saying to us, well, the mom, th th everybody loves it. You know, of course everybody loves it. When I was in prison, every chance that I got to see my children, uh, one of my children who was a, a, a baby, uh, six months old when I went to prison, I, I would, I, of course, I wanted to see my children, uh, but that's not the best uh, uh, situation. And we're smarter than that. We're better than that. And and when we have models like Free Hots have created in Nashville, we get to at the National Council learn about those models and share them. And now our our sisterhood and our fam in other parts of the country learn about these models and they start to to advocate for them and to say, wait a minute, no, it's not a great idea to do a summer camp in a prison. It's a better idea to do a summer camp outside and let the moms come home. It helps us to get closer to our goal of any incarceration of women and girls. Um, a lot of people have asked about if you guys can speak on foster the foster system and how foster girls and their entanglement in the criminal justice system and how they're living under the conditions of law enforcement while in the foster system and just how that can affect girls. Um, so we, so the young woman that we work with, um, 
many of the young women start off in foster care and end up in the juvenile justice system. Um, and, and so there's a few things that happen. One is that um, the, the foster system has a lot of problems in itself, right? It definitely um, tears, tears young folks from their families. It's disruptive. You're in, you're in a home or, or receiving home where you don't know anyone. There's cultural differences, right? Um, there, there's also a lot of uh, explicit and implicit bias and racism about which, which kids are getting taken. One thing that's interesting in, in San Francisco, there are three neighborhoods that the kids come from, from juvenile hall, and it's those same three neighborhoods that the kids that enter foster care, right? Um, and, and so what we see is um, the young women enter foster care, um, oftentimes enter the, the juvenile justice system for things like arguing with a peer. We've, had, we've seen instances like where they're eating at the table and they're having a food fight, the police get called, they get sent to juvenile hall. Um, in fact, there's a, there's a home in California that we're working to shut down. I think in one year there was over 300 calls to the um, to juvenile to police to come pick up the youth, all for very like small things that your kids I don't know that my kids do all the time. Um, uh, and another thing is is then when they're they're in both systems um, that that we're seeing that a lot of of the young um, women and young folks we work with are surviving, um, pushed out and surviving are being trafficked and are doing survival sex work just to survive. Um, so it's definitely these systems are entrenched together and um, we have to look at, at the harm that the child welfare system is doing as well um, to young folks. I, I do wanna say in our, in our research, we've already found, um, and, and we haven't published our first report yet, but that um, we did uh, life maps with three with a hundred um, system involved young women in San Francisco and their ethnographic three hour interviews and we found that a hundred percent if the young woman was in foster care as a young person and she has kids at a hundred percent so far that there's a child welfare case open so we just really have to look at how these how these systems um, criminalize and hurt and um, really work together to create this especially for girls it's you know it's it's not a pipeline it's this web of entanglement that just uh it gets deeper and deeper and it's harder and harder for for the um women and girls to escape from and we've done some some studies on this and research in partnership with the human impact partners around the effects of of separating uh, uh particularly mothers from their children due to incarceration um, how that uh, 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 leads children into the foster care system, how that creates trauma in children uh, due to that separation. And we've done reports in uh, Nashville, um, and we've done report with free in, in in partnership with Free Hearts. We've done a report in Massachusetts, where which was the first state to actually pass the primary caretaker legislation just very recently, which creates a an opportunity for uh, primary caretaker parents to motion the court to not be incarcerated because of the harm that it will the further harm that it will cause their children. And so we have those reports that are available. They're very informative. Human Impact Partners is partnering with the National Council now for this very reason to help people to understand what it means, what, what are the implications when we separate uh, mothers from children uh, uh, because of incarceration. And I'll lastly just say, while we were in Danbury, there uh, we did research as incarcerated women for in, inside of the federal prison. And at the time in Connecticut, 60% of the children that were in chil the children's prison in Connecticut were children that had come out of the foster care system into the children's prison and they had entered the children's the the foster care system because one or both parents were incarcerated um so we'll, we'll just do one more question I'm sorry that we've gone over a couple minutes um what's the biggest point of resistance that everyone has faced or the biggest challenges in your work and, and what are you how are you guys working to overcome this challenge? Anyone can go. Well, I, I think we have a lot of big challenges, um, but uh, I was just gonna say a couple that, are, that have really stood out um, lately. 
we work with young women, so we meet them wherever they're at. So we're in the detention centers. We're working with probation. We're working with um, the the pretty much all of the system players. Our long term goal is structural change, um, and we're not going to leave our sisters behind. Um, and, and I think that that the you know that seems so much like common sense to us, right? And um, and and when we have systems players at the table that say they want to do things differently and we're going to try but at the end of the day it's it's really hard to to move folks to think differently right and to actually believe in the in the in support young women to make decisions about their own lives right and i think that like that that's what we continually have to push for as an organization that the that the brilliance and self-determination that the young women have is really what we need to lead um i think funding this work is hard right we know that, like, if, if we believe those most impacted need to lead, we also know that 100% of the folks that we work with are in poverty and struggling to get their kids back and have ankle monitors and working at Circle K and don't have housing and dealing with all these things that the, the work that they're doing and the brilliance that they bring is super important. And, and maybe folks don't have a, a college degree or high school education, but their, or their voices are important and we need to actually fund those most impacted who are doing this work well so that they can live and do self-care and, and be the leaders that, that um, we need to transform. So we have to be able to figure out how we invest with the, the women, invest in the women on the ground that are leading this work who are most impacted. And I think even as folks in the field, wherever we stand, whether it's a, a foundation, a system player, a researcher, a direct service worker, we have to continually to challenge our own ideals as we're gonna tear down these systems and, and how we're upholding patriarchy and, and white supremacy, because that plays into even our own decisions that we make of, of who are we funding in these positions and how are we resourcing these really grassroots organizations doing great work. I mean, Jess really just uh, hit all the points. And just to just to say this, that uh, uh, the, the organizations of directly affected women doing this work um, are, are, are the most underfunded uh, projects in 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 philanthropy. Um, organizations that are led by uh, Black women are the most underfunded in philanthropy. And then you add to that uh, women of all color who are incarcerated and trying to do this work and to use their voices, we still consistently all the time hear um, that uh, funders just don't think that we're ready to be in the lead and to be responsible for budgets that allow us to do this work. We hear this all the time, usually indirectly. Um, and we wanna just say, take a look at our work. Take a look at the incredible work of the Young Women's Freedom Center. Take a look at the work that Free Hots is doing. Take a look at the work that the National Council is doing to connect all of us and to raise up these incredible ideas and to coalition build all of the local work that's doing so that we can use our voices collectively and our power collectively. That's important work. We are the experts and we don't need an intermediary to help us uh, to figure out what needs to be done. We need some direct funding coming directly to us so that we can make the decisions as to what projects are going to be worked on and when they're going to be done. So I would just encourage folks to trust us, believe in us, and look at the work that we're doing. John, do you have any closing thoughts, anything you wanna say or NASCO? Oh, you're still on mute. I definitely um, agree with Andrea and um, Jessica as far as that. that is a huge challenge um, funding this work, especially um, that is led by formerly incarcerated women, but it, it's very important. Um, another huge challenge for us is just being in the South and um, the culture of slavery and racism that still exists here. and um, and the, the, the lack of resources um, here in the South. Um, um, not to mention, you know, uh, we're located in at the home of, of Core Civic, CCA. So 
the private prison industry also plays a huge, uh, it, it, it poses a huge challenge because um, a lot of, of wanting to keep things the way that they are and not wanting to, um, to decrease people's bottom line uh, due to wanting to divert women and girls into the community as opposed to under correctional supervision where, where people are making a lot of money on it here. So um, that has been a huge challenge, just navigating those um, those dynamics, uh, not to mention like our chair of our city judiciary is married to a principal lobbyist for, um, for Core Civic and Global Tail Link. So yeah, those, those dynamics have, have posed a, a huge challenge for us. Oh, can, I, no. can I just quickly mention something before we go? I just don't want to not mention it. It'll take me two seconds. On July 21st in communities across the country, the National Council in collaboration with all of our local uh, uh, organizations uh, are doing a national town hall titled Ending Incarceration of Women and Girls. We will have, we're launching a brand new website and it, it will be up over the next couple of days, but we are having uh, again, a national town hall, to, uh, a gathering of women, girls, and fam to talk about ending incarceration of women and girls and how we get there. It'll be held in 21 so far communities across the country. Um, and uh, we invite uh, uh, folks to come and, and go on to the website, find out, and all this information will be on social media and on our website very soon to find a click on the town that's closest to you and participate. And lastly, in September, we have our national conference, the Free Her Conference happening in Tulsa, Oklahoma, September 28th, 29th, and 30th. We have RFPs out right now. If anybody's interested in submitting an RFP for the conference, for a workshop, we would love to have you. Um, and uh, so stay tuned, keep checking back for the information about the town hall, but it's the same day at the same time in communities across the country, ending incarceration of women and girls and how we get there. Well, thank you. Um, thank you to everyone who participated in this webinar. Um, yes, there's lots of more questions about talking about you know, how can we get involved and are there chapters of free hearts, you know, all over the country. So, you know, on this last uh, webinar slide, I've listed everyone's websites and I really encourage you to check them out. And if you have any additional questions, please feel free to email me. My email's at the bottom and I can make sure I send them along to all of our great panelists. Um, uh, you'll get an email soon get, uh, with a link to the recording of this webinar. And thank you again for everyone for participating. Happy Juneteenth.